Today uh, we have with us uh, Dr. Uh, Joshua Kraus. He's a postdoctoral researcher at the Department of Social and Economic Statistics at Trier University. His research interests are statistical modeling, regularized regression analysis, and computational statistics with applications in the field of social medicine and epidemiology. Uh, Dr. Kraus uh, defended successfully his PhD work uh, this year. He's a very active researcher. Uh, he's collaborating with me in a smaller estimation, and he's going to present, a, 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 I am sure, a very nice talk. So if you want to, to say some few words be, be, before starting the, the, the talk, uh, Joshua. <laughs> Well, thank you, everybody. Um, thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to uh, give a presentation to your institution. And uh, the presentation uh, contains uh, uh, subjects from my PhD thesis that I have defended uh, earlier this year. And uh, I hope you will enjoy and find it very informative. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. My name is Joscha Krause, and I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Department of Economic and Social Statistics at Trier University. It is my pleasure to provide a talk to you today at your institution, and I would like to thank Professor Juan Aparigio and Professor Domingo Morales for the invitation. The topic of this presentation is regularized small area estimation, a framework for robust estimates in the presence of unknown measurement errors. I was told that there will be some PhD students in the audience, so I want to provide some meta information with respect to this presentation. So the contents that we are about to cover today were part of my PhD thesis, which has the title Regularization Methods for Statistical Modeling in Small Area Estimation. But apart from these insights, uh, further contents of my thesis were regularization for combining unit and area level data and regularization for generalized linear mixed models under covariate rank deficiency. So you can see that the general topic of my PhD thesis was the combination of small area estimation and regularization methods. I have written the thesis at the Department of Economic and Social Statistics at Trier University in Germany. Uh, my first supervisor was Professor Dr. Ralf Münich and my second supervisor was Professor Domingo Morales. And uh, I defended the thesis in March 2020 and published it in May 2020, so just a few weeks ago. So let us then start with the actual presentation. Let us have a look at the contents. I first will provide a short motivation of the issues that we're going to talk today. Afterwards, I will present a certain concept of robust regression that we refer to as min-max robustification. And afterwards, I will use this concept of min-max robustification in order to derive a robust version of the unit level model provided by Batiste, Harter and Fuller. Afterwards, I will address the topic of prediction and mean squared error estimation. Thereafter, we will talk about some um, selected simulation studies that were conducted. And I will close the presentation with some conclusions and an outlook on future research. So let us start with the motivation then. We may start with some general information about small area estimation. Um, small area estimation represents a class of methods for the stable estimation of area statistics, so aggregate specific quantities within the population, from small samples. The baseline problem is that direct estimators, so classical sample-based estimators, are typically subject to unacceptable uncertainty due to large sampling variances that occur in the presence of small samples. Small area estimation solves this problem by linking a response variable of interest, from which the area statistics are calculated, to a statistically related covariates in suitable regression models. And the basic idea is to use data from multiple areas for model parameter estimation. And with this, the effective sample size for the estimation of a given area statistic can be increased. 
The estimation of the area statistic then is performed by means of predictions from the corresponding model for which we have estimated the model parameters. And you may refer to Rao and Molina for a comprehensive overview on small error estimation. So with this general construction, the efficiency advantage of small error estimation methods over classical direct estimators depends on the explanatory power of the assumed regression model. Accordingly, we would like to find different sources for covariates that we could use in order to maximize the explanatory power of our regression model. And for this, in small area estimation, typically standard survey or census data is used. However, in recent years, there is a fast growing number and volume of new data sources that could be considered in order to improve the regression models such as online data or process data or whatsoever. These data sources mark valuable additions to small area estimation and should be considered. The main problem is that the records obtained from these sources are often subject to measurement errors. So the data contained is uncertain. And if this is the case, then the regression model must explicitly account for data uncertainty in order to allow for reliable results. Of course, the issue of measurement errors is not only related to new data sources. Survey data and records provided by official statistics can also be subject to measurement errors. And there's actually an extended literature on how to deal with these issues. And the typical tool used are so-called measurement error models. So the general idea of these methods is to introduce distribution assumptions on the measurement error and then make statistical inference under this premise. And you may refer to these sources for some exemplary descriptions and applications. Nevertheless, we have to keep in mind that the efficiency of these measurement error models heavily depends on the validity of the corresponding distribution assumptions. And here we have the problem. In contrast to survey data, the measurement errors in modern data sources are often not controllable or not quantifiable. If we have records that have been estimated from standard survey data, we know these records are associated with uncertainty because they have been estimated. However, under the anticipation of the corresponding sampling design, we can say something about the measurement error distribution on this point. This does not hold for online data to the same extent as the origin of the data is often unknown and we typically have problems like under or the over coverage and a general lack in quality of the data records. So an important question is, can we achieve robust estimation results without distribution assumptions on the measurement error? And in today's presentation, we will show that this can be achieved via regularization methods. But before we start, let us first clarify the term regularization. And for this, we investigate a classical regression situation. We have a response vector, Y, and we have a design matrix, X, that contains the realization of our covariates. And we have a loss function, G. And typically what we do in a question analysis is we try to minimize this loss here by choosing a suitable vector of regression parameters beta. A regularized regression problem looks slightly different. We're still minimizing the loss function here by choosing beta. However, we have an additional term here with this lambda times a function h that is evaluated with beta. And this lambda is a so-called regularization parameter that is greater than zero, and this h is a so-called penalty function. And the inclusion of this penalty term here changes the nature of the optimal solution to the optimization problem considerably. And in the literature, typically something like this is used in order to perform high dimensional estimation. So where the number of parameters P is greater than the number of observations N. And uh, further applications are variable selection by inducing sparsity or to account for multicollinearity. So when the axes are very closely 
correlated. So for these uh, applications, penalization is typically used. And prominent examples from the literature are the least absolute shrinkage and selection operator, or short lasso, rich regression, or the so-called elastic net. However, as already indicated, we will show that regularization has further uses than these standard uses. And for this, we will address a specific concept of robust estimation that is called min-max robustification. So let us start with a short introduction to the general problem. So imagine a situation where our observations of our covariates are subject to measurement errors. That is to say, we have observed a matrix x tilde, which equals the original x matrix, so the matrix of true covariate values, plus a matrix D, which stands for an error matrix. So this matrix here contains some unknown error terms. And we assume that only x tilde is observable, while its individual components x and d are unknown. And if we then want to do regression analysis, we have to minimize the empirical loss based on the erroneous covariate observations. And the question now is, how can we account for this uncertainty that is in this x tilde here? And for this, we can rely on developments from robust optimization theory, because it provides us with an alternative concept of regression. So let us have a look at this optimization problem here. We are still minimizing the loss by choosing beta. However, we have an additional matrix, delta, which is called perturbation matrix. And this perturbation matrix is chosen maximal with respect to some set U. And this set U is called uncertainty set and it resembles the level of anticipated uncertainty in our matrix x tilde. And it does so without any distribution assumptions, because the solution that we obtain from solving this problem here is optimal under a given level of uncertainty rather than a distribution. Thus, the solution is robust against measurement errors of a given magnitude. And we refer to this concept of robustification as min-max robustification. However, in the literature there are other names for this, for example uncertain regression or conservative regression. The main question now is, how can such a problem be solved? Because it is not directly obvious how to implement this. And in order to answer this question, we can draw from theoretical insights by Wertzimas and Copenhaver, and based on their insights, we can derive the following theorem. So we don't have to go in too much detail. Basically, on the left-hand side of this equation here is a very generic min-max robustification problem. Let us call it like that. And on the right-hand side, we have a very generic regularized regression problem. And this equivalence holds for a very generic uncertainty set U. So what does this theorem mean? Well, it basically states that regularized regression is equivalent to min-max robustification. And this equivalence holds for a wide range of regularization methods, including the already mentioned lasso, rich regression and the elastic net. So with respect to small error estimation, this implies we can obtain robust model parameter estimates and with this robust area statistic predictions by using regularization. And we already said that this concept of robustification does not rely on distribution assumptions regarding the measurement error. Because the magnitude of the feasible noise that can be added to our optimization problem without compromising the optimality of our solution, this is determined by the regularization parameters. And more so, the nature of the robustification effect is determined by the penalty term. We will address this issue later. So, in what follows, 
we will use this concept of min-max robustification in order to derive a robust version of the basic unit level model for small area estimation by Batiste, Hatter and Fuller. So let us address the robust unit level model. For this, we have to clarify the statistical framework in which we try to achieve inference. So we assume we have a finite population U of n individuals that are indexed by i. And we assume that U is segmented into disjoint areas Uj of size nj that are indexed by j. We assume that the random sample S is drawn from U of size small n and we assume that the sampling scheme is such that there are area specific subsampled sj a subset of uj of size nj greater zero for all considered areas we have a response variable y from which the area statistic of interest is calculated we have a set of covariates x that are statistically related to y and our objective is it to estimate the area-specific mean of y that is calculated according to this for all areas of the population. And as databases, we have a sample with our response observations and our contaminated covariate observations. We have uh, administrative records of aggregated values of covariates. These might be subject to measurement errors. We don't know. Yeah? And these X bar and D bar here are theoretical population means in the area UJ. Okay. Then let us look at the robust unit level model. Let us temporarily assume that the response variable is generated with errors. Of course, in practice, it is generated without errors. However, we temporarily assume it in order to introduce this concept of robustification that we're using. So under this premise, the robust unit level model is defined as follows. It is basically a linear mixed model with a random intercept on the area level. We have here our area specific observations for the response variable. Here our contaminated covariate values, regression parameter vector. Here's our random intercept that is assumed to follow a normal distribution with expectation zero and the variance parameter psi squared. And we have a vector E which contains model errors that are also assumed to follow a normal distribution with expectation zero and a variance parameter sigma squared. And under these standard assumptions, we can conclude that the conditional response distribution given the random intercept is a normal distribution with this expectation here and a covariance matrix sigma squared times this identity matrix here. And the unconditional response distribution is also a normal distribution with this expectation here and a covariance matrix Vj that is defined like this. And we have already said that our objective is it to estimate the area specific mean of y. And in order to do so, we need to derive the best predictors of the corresponding characteristic under the model. The best predictor is the conditional expectation of the characteristic given the response observations under the preliminary assumptions of known model parameters. Of course, in practice, the model parameters are unknown. This is why the best predictor is afterwards substituted by the so-called empirical best predictor. So that basically takes the formula for the best predictor and replaces the known model parameters by empirical best estimates. But of course, in order to derive the empirical best predictor, we first need to derive the best predictor. And this is what's done on this slide. So let us define the full parameter vector theta that contains the regression parameters and this vector eta that contains the variance parameters. And then the best predictors under the model are obtained as follows. We have this formula here for the best predictor of the random intercept realization, which is required because it is random. And this is given like this. 
this gamma j is a so-called shrinkage parameter and these are sample means. So this is the sample mean of y uh, in the area j and this is the sample mean of the true covariate values and these are the sample means of the corresponding uh, measurement error terms. So this is the best predictor for our random intercept realization and this is plugged in into this formula here which yields us the best predictor for the area-specific mean of y. However, if you look closely, you see that in order to apply this formula, it is required to have covariate observations, not only for all individuals in the sample, but for all individuals in the population. And this is, of course, not practical, because it requires that we have a census file which we rarely have in practice. This is why in practice, oftentimes a so-called small sample approximation is used. And this was proposed by Batista and Fuller. So if the sampling fraction in the corresponding area is small, then we can say that the area specific mean of Y is closely enough approximated by a quantity mu J which can be calculated from the area-specific means of the covariates rather than all the realization of the covariates in the respective area. And this is basically what's done here. So we're using this formula here for the best predictor of our area-specific quantity. And as I said, we need to replace this vector theta here by an empirical estimate. And this estimate has to be robust because we have measurement errors in our sample observations. And this is what's done here. So let us define the stacked uh, vector and the stacked matrices here. And in order to demonstrate robust model parameter estimation, we uh, temporarily assume that the variance parameters eta are known. Yeah? The complete procedure for model parameter estimation, where eta is also estimated, is shown hereafter. We first start with the regression parameter estimation. And given the insights on minmax robustification from the last section, we obtain a robust solution for our beta here by solving this problem here. So this is a min-max robustification problem that can be used for the data structure of your robust unit level model. And in order to solve this problem, by theorem 1, we now have to choose a suitable regularization. However, as I said, we have to be aware that the nature of the robustification effect depends on the regularization. So basically every regularization term that fits into theorem 1 provides a proper robustification. However, the nature in which the robustification is achieved, this changes. And we will see what this means. The first case that we are considering is to use rich regression for robust estimation. So we obtain rich regression if we use theorem 1 with these specifications here. So if we plug these terms into theorem 1, we obtain rich regression. And then it follows that our minmax robust model parameter estimation problem that was given like this is equivalent to this rich regression problem here. So rich regression is basically just the least squares problem with an additional penalty term, which is the squared L2 norm of the regression parameters. So this is rich regression. And these two are equivalent for this particular specification of the uncertainty set. Yeah? And if we analyze this uncertainty set here, we can show that with this manifestation of the robustification effect, the maximum singular value of the perturbation matrix delta is bounded by the corresponding uncertainty set parameter phi. And of course, as this perturbation matrix is artificially introduced in order to resemble the level of uncertainty in XTILDE, using rich regression implies that the maximum singular value of the error matrix D is 
bounded. And we will see that for the second regularization that we are going to consider, it is different. But first, let us observe this in a more uh, graphical form. So this is a graphical illustration of rich regression. So what we have here are ISO loss curves yeah, for the loss function. And this beta hat here marks the original value of the OLS regression estimate, so the ordinary least squares regression estimate. And this red area here is the restricted area that stems from the squared L2 norm. So basically what rich regression does is it provides a corresponding bound to the L2 norm by restricting this area here. And this geometric form of the restricted area then induces a certain robustification effect, which refers to the maximum singular value that I just referred to. As promised, we look at the second case for regularization, namely at the least absolute shrinkage and selection operator, or short lasso. So the lasso can achieve robust estimation in the sense of theorem one for these particular specifications here. So if we plug them into theorem one, we obtain the lasso. And then it follows that our robust model parameter estimation problem from min-max robustification here is equivalent to this problem here under a specific uncertainty set that is defined like this. So the contrast to rich regression is that the penalty function looks differently. So the penalty function under rich regression was the squared L2 norm of the regression parameters and under the lasso it is the L1 norm. And this of course changes the look of the corresponding uncertainty set. And therefore the nature of the robustification effect is different as well. One can show that the uncertainty set parameter phi provides an upper bound to the column-wise L2 norm of the perturbation matrix. So while rich regression provides an upper bound to the entire uh, perturbation matrix, this phi here under the lasso provides a component-wise restriction to the perturbation matrix. So as for rich regression, let us look at this graphically. Here we have a graphical illustration of the lasso. The setting is the same. We have again our ISO loss curves that are centered at the original OS estimate. However, we have another um, restricted area. For rich regression, we have this ball here. Yeah? And for the lasso, we have this diamond-shaped restricted area. And this graph here is typically uh, introduced in order to demonstrate the variable selection properties of the lasso because the lasso induces a sparse solution to model parameter estimation. However, this is not of interest here. We want to look at the robustification effect and this different geometrical property of the restricted area induces a column-wise bound to the perturbation matrix rather than the comprehensive entire bound by rich regression, which was induced by the round restricted area. Nevertheless, it is important to say that robustification is achieved in any case. So min-max robustification does not rely on finding like the proper um, penalty function for the data. This is not the case. It is just the manner in which robustification is achieved varies between penalty functions. So let us say we have chosen any of the corresponding um, uh, functions. Let's say we have chosen rich regression. Yeah? And then we can look at the entire procedure for model parameter estimation, which would then be done in practice. You may remember that we have assumed that the variance parameters are known, but of course in practice they are unknown. So here is uh, an overview on the entire procedure for model parameter estimation. We first have to choose a value, lambda, greater zero, in order to resemble the uncertainty. And then we have to define an initial estimate, eta tilde, 
that can be obtained from any suitable method. Yeah? And then based on this initial estimate, we find a robust solution for beta by solving this robust regression problem, which by theorem one is equivalent to this regularized regression problem here, a fridge regression. And this can be done, for instance, via pathwise gradient descent. And then given this robust solution for beta, we find a proper estimate for the variance parameters via maximum likelihood estimation. And this can be done, for instance, via the newton refson algorithm. And then, basically, we have to repeat step two and three, always conditional on each other, until convergence is achieved. And in my thesis, I could show that this estimation approach allows for consistency in model parameter estimation. And basically means that this deviation here approaches zero as n goes towards infinity under certain assumptions. For uh, further details, you may refer to my PhD thesis. It is summarized in theorem 4.2. Okay, so we have addressed the robust unit level model and let us now investigate uh, empirical best prediction and the corresponding MSE estimation. So let us have a look at it. We first define the robust best predictor under the model. Uh, you may remember the insights from proposition one where we derived the, um, the best predictor under the model. And then we used a small sample approximation for a shorter formula. And now we're substituting uh, the vector of model parameters theta by a robust estimator theta hat that is obtained from our minmox robust estimation algorithm that we just got to know. An important remaining task is to assess the reliability of the corresponding robust best predictor. And for this, we have to remember that our predictions are based on contaminated data sources. And a suitable measure in order to assess the reliability is the mean squared error or short MSE and is generally given by this formula here. However, uh, we cannot evaluate it analytically because we don't know the true value of mu j. But um, in order to quantify it, we can follow theoretical developments by Zhang and colleagues and we do a two-step procedure. We first derive the conditional MSE under the assumption of known model parameters as we had it for the best predictor. And afterwards, we use a jackknife approach in order to account for additional uncertainty that results from model parameter estimation. So we first state the conditional MSE under the assumption of known model par parameters and afterwards we apply the jackknife algorithm in order to account for the parameter uncertainty. So let us do so. The conditional mean squared error on contaminated data is given by this short formula here. However, this causes problems. Why? Well, this dj component here is unknown. It comes from the measurement error and we have assumed that the measurement error is always unknown. Therefore, despite knowledge of the model parameter vector theta, we cannot evaluate the conditional MSE. So natural question would be, if we have contaminated data and we assume that the contamination is unknown, is there any possibility at all to quantify the conditional MSE? However, there is one. We can find an upper limit for the conditional MSE because under minmax robustification, it holds that this expression here is always smaller or equal this expression here and this expression here is always smaller or equal this expression here. And the last expression directly comes from the uncertainty set that we have defined before. This phi here is an unknown uncertainty set parameter and it has a non-trivial positive relation to the regularization parameter lambda. Therefore, under minmax robustification, the conditional mean squared error is bounded by this term here. However, in order to find the exact value of the bound, 
we first have to recover the relation between phi and lambda. And this relation depends on the regularization term that we have chosen. So we have to look at different cases depending on uh, what regularization we have considered. And this we will do hereafter. So recall that we have considered two regularizations. The first was rich regression and the second was the lasso. And so we start with rich regression. And for the case that rich regression is used for model parameter estimation in the case of min-max robustification, the relation between lambda and phi is defined by this term here. Right, so this is for the case that the uncertainty set looks like this and our beta hat is uh, optimal solution to the rich regression problem. So please note that the relation between phi and lambda depends on the optimal solution to the corresponding optimization problem. So this is the relation for, for a case of rich regression. So for the lasso, it looks slightly different. There the relation between phi and lambda is characterized like this. And then we have this uncertainty set here. And again, the corresponding relation depends on the optimal solution to the respective optimization problem. So the remaining part is that we now take the corresponding relation, yeah, either from lasso or from rich regression, depending on what we have chosen. And we will use it in order to find the upper boundary on the conditional MSE for this term here, yeah, which then bounds this term here. And this we will then use all together within a jackknife algorithm in order to get proper MSE estimates for the empirical best predictor or robust best predictor as we called him. And for this we use the delete1 jackknife algorithm in order to account for the parameter uncertainty and we define this corresponding term here is basically the upper bound of the best predictor. However, we have substituted the known model parameters by the robust estimates. Yeah? And then essentially what is done, we delete the observations of a given area from the sample. Yeah? For this is the observations from area UK. And the sample out of this is SK. So we delete the observations SK and perform model parameter estimation based on the remaining observations. And given these results that we obtain, we then calculate the boundary that is defined like this. And we also calculate the robust best predictors for all areas, including the kth one. And we repeat this procedure over and over again until the observations of every area have been deleted once. And once this is finalized, uh, we just have to plug in all the results into this formula here that was obtained by Zhang and colleagues. And this then obtains us the proper MSE estimate uh, for our robust best predictor. However, at this point, we have to take a closer look because um, the formula is used as for the uh, MSE estimator of an uh, empirical best predictor. However, what we have here is not a, like a classical MSE estimate. We refer to it as a pessimistic MSE estimate. Why? Because we used this upper boundary here. Yeah? For the estimation, we did not use a real conditional MSE like this, yeah, because we couldn't, this component here was unknown, we used an upper boundary for that. And we further recall that min-max robustification is equivalent to an estimation under a worst case anticipation of uncertainty. Therefore, this upper bound will always be greater than this one here. And naturally, the related um, estimate PMSE yeah, will always overestimate the true MSE because we have this unknown uncertainty and we are always doing this worst case analysis with respect to the effect of the perturbations on prediction. Therefore, we will always overestimate the true MSE. However, 
as we have no distribution assumptions, there's no further information that we could exploit. So this is basically the best thing we can do. So you may also refer to this as an estimated upper bound for the MSE. Okay, so that was enough of the theory. Let us now have a look at the simulation study. So what is the setup? We make a Monte Carlo simulation with 500 iterations. And for this, we generate a population of size 50,000 with 100 equally sized areas. And we draw a random sample of 500 individuals from the population with area specific sample size equal to five. And please note, we draw the sample once in order to properly reflect the randomization under the model because we're looking at a fixed covariate setting. This means that we generate the covariates, the true values once with this specification here and keep them fixed over all Monte Carlo iterations. And the same holds for the corresponding sample. However, the response realizations are generated in each um, iteration of the simulation individually and we um, generate them with this specification here. So we generate them without measurement errors. And after the covariate and response realizations are generated, we then perform data contamination. That is, we add the errors to the X matrix. And for this, we consider four different scenarios. The first scenario is no measurement errors. So this is our reference scenario. The second scenario is symmetric, but weakly correlated measurement errors. The correlation is between columns of the D matrix. Scenario three, we have symmetric, but strongly correlated measurement errors. Again, the correlation is with respect to the columns of D. And for scenario four, we have asymmetric errors, where we draw the measurement error realizations from a transformed chi-squared distribution. We perform regularization parameter tuning via cross-validation, and we consider the subsequent methods. We consider the basic Batista Fuller model, then the robust model under L1 penalization, which is the lasso, and the robust model under L2 penalization, which refers to rich regression. So let us have a look at the results. So we start with the results of area mean prediction. And for this, we look at the relative deviation that is depicted like this, the relative deviation of estimates from the true values. And here we have the corresponding densities for the EPLAB under the standard Batista Fuller model and for the robust best predictor under the robust unit level model with L2 penalization. And as can be seen, in the absence of measurement errors, the results for both methods are approximately the same. This is due to the fact that the optimal regularization parameter in this setting is close to zero. And then the um, robust empirical best predictor is close to the empirical best predictor. However, if we introduce um, measurement errors, then we see performance differences quite a bit. So we, what we see here is basically the classical result. The um, density of the regularized approach is more concentrated. However, this comes at the cost of a small bias. Yeah? So regularization introduces bias in order to decrease the variance. And if the relation between these two components is right, the overall MSE is decreased. And this is what's, what's uh, demonstrated here. So in these settings, the regularization parameter is increased and this induces the small bias. However, ultimately the MSE is decreased and our estimates are more stable and more robust. And this is also what becomes evident in this table here. Here we see the prediction performance of the EPLAB, the robust best predictor under the L2 regularization, which is rich regression, and the robust best predictor under the lasso. And here for all the four scenarios, and we look at different performance measures, mean squared error, relative root mean squared error, bias, and relative bias. And what we see 
uh, in the absence of measurement errors, the performance of these methods are pretty much the same because the regularization parameter is close to zero. However, in the presence of measurement errors, so in these scenarios here, we see clear efficiency advantages of the regularized approaches as their MSE is much, much smaller than for the unregularized approach under the EPLAP. We see that the MSEs of the regularized approaches are always smaller than for the unregularized approach. However, we see also that there is some bias. So this is basically the trade-off. We introduce some bias in order to robustify our estimates, which ultimately leads to more ro robust and more efficient results. Let us continue with the results of model parameter estimation. Here we have a table where the fitting results of the standard maximum likelihood algorithm and the L1 regularized as well as the L2 regularized versions of it are depicted. And uh, we have the performance measures of the mean squared error for the regression parameters as well as the bias for the regression parameters. And we have the MSE for the variance parameters as well as the bias of the variance parameters. We start with regression parameter estimation and we see in the absence of measurement errors, um, the maximum likelihood approach is slightly more efficient, yeah, but only a very tiny bit. And in the presence of measurement errors, the regularized approaches are more efficient. So here we see that um, the mean squared error of the regression parameter estimation is clearly more efficient under the robust approach. So this was expected given the min-max robustification theory that we have introduced. However, an interesting result is also that the variance parameter estimation seems to be improved by min-max robustification as well, because the corresponding MSE is also smaller for the variance parameters in the presence of measurement errors. And this was a bit of a surprise, to be honest, because this Robustification argument mainly holds for the vector elements that are in the regularization term, which are the regression parameters. However, as we're doing this conditional estimation scheme that we're estimating the variance parameters given the regression parameters and vice versa, um, this robustification effect spills over, so to say. So with the robust beta estimates, we can also robustify our variance parameter estimates, which leads to the efficiency gains in these settings here. Let us finally investigate the results of mean squared error estimation by our jackknife algorithm. And here we see the results for the regularized approaches in all four settings. And the main performance measure is the relative bias of the MSE estimation. And we see that in the absence of measurement errors, the relative bias is close to zero. So we're basically having uh, an unbiased estimate. This is plausible because the optimal regularization parameter is close to zero in these settings. And therefore these predictors are basically empirical best predictors for which the jackknife algorithm is known to work. In the presence of measurement errors, so in these scenarios here, we see a clear overestimation tendency and the overestimation tendency ranges from, as we see, like 68 to 90 percent overestimation. This is quite a bit. However, we have to recall that this is no MSE estimation in the classical sense. It is more like an estimated upper MSE bound under the assumption of maximal perturbations for each individual prediction. Here. So this is this underlying assumption that we had to introduce with min-max robustification in general, because we're making no distribution assumptions on the measurement error. This implies that potentially for every observation, we have the maximum possible perturbation in this respective observation. And therefore, if we anticipate this in MSE estimation, we will overestimate the true MSE in basically any case. But as I said, this is the price we have to pay in order to have no distribution assumptions. It would have been possible to get more efficient estimates 
if we could introduce distribution assumptions. So if we could say, okay, the measurement error is symmetric or maybe it is uniform over all areas, then we could reduce this relative bias of MSE estimation because then you could introduce additional terms that would decrease it. However, as we said, we have no distribution assumptions, then this is the best we can do. So let us come to a conclusion and to the end of the talk. We have seen that minmax robustification is a very effective tool for small error estimation in the presence of measurement errors. It is very widely applicable, computationally efficient and easy to implement because it is based on regularized regression and regularized regression is well known for many years and is pre-implemented in basically any statistical software package of your choice. The remaining aspect is the MSE estimation. It is very conservative, but it is consistent with the setting to the extent that if we do not want to introduce any distribution assumptions on the errors, then our MSE estimates have to be conservative. With respect to future research, as I already said, the nature of the robustification effect depends on the regularization. So a natural question would be, is there a way to choose an optimal regularization given a certain data contamination. And a related question is, is there a way to empirically find an uncertainty set? And a further question for future research is the robustness concept that we discussed. It holds for linear models, linear mixed models and generalized linear models. Question is, can it also be applied to generalized linear mixed models? Where, have, where we have the link functions and probably the Laplace approximation, it is not clear whether this works in these settings. So with these comments, I want to close the talk. Thank you very much for your attention. And here are some further references. Thank you very much. Hay alguna pregunta que alguien quiera realizar? Eh, Domingo. Uh, and your your microphone. <laughs> okay, I I, I I want to formulate a, a, a questions. Do, do you hear me? Uh, I am. Is, yes. Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, th this talk is 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 about uh, how how to translate a problem of uh, a reg regression method with measurement errors to to the field of regularization method and this, and this is interesting because a, a min max uh, optimization problems is translated to a maximization problem with penalization and and this is regularization but re regularizations in 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 regression analysis can be applied in in other fields uh, can you say uh, something about what other fields can can be used uh, regularization and when it is worthwhile to use, to use regularization with respect, for, ex for example, with ordinary least square regression, uh, what do we, we gain or what do we lose when we go to these robust approaches? Yes, it's a little bit philosophical, but just to, to know about your opinion. Okay, thank you very much for the question. So the uh, basic application fields for uh, regularization methods are uh, high dimensional inference. So that refers to optimization problems where the number of model parameters is greater than the number of observations. And typically these uh, optimization problems are then uh, so-called ill post. And then you can uh, introduce regularization to make it a well-posed problem and get the solution nevertheless. And another um, uh, application field would be uh, uh, covariate settings where you have strong correlation between covariates. This uh, applies specifically to rich regression. So rich regression was originally um, proposed to account for situations where there is strong covariate correlation. But these days, regularization is very much applied in this uh, high dimensional inference setting and especially also to uh, to problems with uh, variable selection, as for instance, the, the lasso or the elastic net are so-called sparsity inducing regularizations. And this implies that in the process of model parameter estimation, they induce uh, model parameter estimates 
exactly equal to zero for covariates that do not have a sufficiently strong cor uh, correlation to the response variable. So these three applications are the standard applications, high dimensional inference, variable selection, and um, uh, multicollinearity. And with respect to um, when it should be applied, well, uh, as we have these new insights that it uh, corresponds to uh, uh, an approach to robustification, I would see that it is applicable to basically all data settings where we have doubt with respect to the, the data quality, which especially corresponds to these new data sources that we are currently exploring, such as big data, process data, where the origin is uh, uh, often unknown, the origin of the data, and also the, the data uh, observations are usually quite noisy. And for these settings, it is a, a very, a very good approach, I think. And what we lose with regularization? Well, as we have seen, that regularization induces some bias to estimation and also to prediction to some extent. So the worst case would be that our uh, estimates are too conservative to the extent that the model parameters are drawn towards zero. But um, as we uh, have seen, uh, we uh, used uh, specific methods in order to determine the magnitude of the regularization parameter. More specifically, uh, more specifically we used cross-validation. And we see that cross-validation is sensitive, or sensible at least, to, uh, to uh, measurement errors. So that in the presence of measurement errors, the optimal regularization parameter that is found by cross-validation is far away from zero. And in the absence of measurement errors, it is close to zero. So with cross-validation, we have an empirical measure that uh, somehow assesses the, uh, the data quality indirectly. And with this, even if we have no measurement errors, we do not lose too much if we use regularization. So this is, I think, a great, uh, great advantage of this method. Thank you, Joshua. There are, uh, are there uh, any, any, any other questions related with the talk? Well, if not, uh, or, or yes. No, there, I think there's not any question more because I don't see anyone writing on the chat right now. Then, then, then I, I would like to to do a, a final question, not not related with the with the talk, but uh, related with the doctorate studies in in Germany. I would like to know uh, how they are. Mm, small comments, no, 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 not a big talk on that. And overall, a point that is very, very interesting for our students. And, and the point is, when, when uh, let's say, a manuscript uh, can be uh, defended in, in Germany, which are the, the inside filters before, before uh, uh, you are a director or someone in the university tells you, you can defend your thesis? Okay, thank you. So uh, first and foremost, um, it depends on the manner of uh, PhD path that you take, so to say. So we have roughly two separate um, um, paths. The one would be writing a classical uh, manuscript of, let's say, between 150 and 250 pages. And the other path would be um, what is called a cumulative uh, PhD. Um, then you have to uh, publish uh, at least three papers that are somehow contextually related and of um, yeah sufficient scientific quality but at, at a good journal. So you theoretically could uh, uh, not write a manuscript but uh, submit and uh, get accepted three articles and that then would be equivalent to uh, the, the task of writing a manuscript uh, for your PhD thesis. But your, uh, your question more referred to the, to the manuscript. And this uh, uh, very much depends on the con context because uh, in Germany, uh, it is so that your, uh, the people that are testing you uh, for your PhD th defense are the same that also are your supervisors. I heard this is different in, in, in Spain. So um, the people that uh, supervise your PhD thesis are also the people that uh, will uh, uh, make questions at the defense. And usually it is that the, the first and supervisor uh, have conversations, you know, what should everything be in, included in the thesis? And then you basically, in correspondence with them, uh, write your manuscript. 
And uh, afterwards, if you uh, feel comfort confident that you have achieved a certain uh, uh, level of analysis, so to say, then you can discuss this with uh, your PhD uh, supervisors. And then they basically say, okay, then um, you may uh, submit and try to defend. Or maybe there's some additional work to do and you still need further time. But again, this is, this is really, uh, really roughly because it depends on the, uh, the scientific field you're writing in. But with respect to statistics, it is somewhat like that. Okay, thank you.